So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all so much for being here. My name is Emily. Again, I'm a reference librarian at the Watertown Free Public Library. We're so excited um, to have Peter with us tonight. Um, before I get started um, introducing our author, um, I would just like to take the time to talk about a couple of technical things. When you join, um, please refrain from using your camera and stay muted. Um, if you have any questions over the course of Peter's talk, please feel free to um, submit them in the chat box. I will be monitoring that and we will have time for Q&A at the end of the session. Um, and I think that is all on the technical side. Um, I will go ahead and pull up my intro. Okay, Peter, are you ready? I am ready. All right, okay, so Peter Del Tredici is an American botanist and author. He is a former senior research scientist at the Arnold Arboretum of 35 years and a lecturer at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He was appointed curator of the Lars Anderson Bonsai Collection in 1982 and was the editor of the journal Arnoldia from 1989 to 1992. Del Tredici is a California, is a native Californian. He got his Bachelor of Arts degree in Geology from UC Berkeley, um, his Master of Arts in Biology from the University of Oregon. He moved to Boston and established his career to earn his doctorate in biology from Boston University. Um, Peter is an advocate of the quote, radically practical approach to urban plant life, holding that what some people see as a collection of undesirable, undesirable plants should be viewed as a valuable ecosystem unique to the hostile habitat of the city. Tonight, we are very lucky that Peter will talk to us about his publication, Wild Urban Plants of the Northeast, a field guide, which catalogs and describes the many species of urban wildflowers, weeds, and other plants that flourish without human support, and in which he makes the case that they can be beneficial for the quality of urban life. So please join me in welcoming Peter. We're very happy to have you. Take it away. Well, thank you, Emily, for that introduction. I appreciate it. My only regret is that uh, I'm not able to do this in person. Uh, you know, when we set this up back in February, uh, it was all set for uh, late June, and we were talking about, you know, a talk at the library and then maybe a, a walk along the Charles River, but um, events have intervened, and so this is uh, what we've got. Um, and so what I've done tonight is uh, I've put a few slides in, essentially uh, pictures from the book that were taken in Watertown. So I'm trying to make this as much a, you know, not just a, a, a static lecture, but you know, it has a little bit of a feel of walking along the Charles River in Watertown. Now, I'm gonna just jump right in uh, to the lecture and there'll be, save your questions till the end and, uh, you know, enter them in the chat box and Emily will sort of read them to me at the end. But the, the topic for tonight is really the, the basic question, what constitutes nature in uh, an urban context? What does it mean to talk about nature when you live in the city? Now this opening slide, um, I took this picture in Detroit. Uh, it's not Photoshop, this is actually the way it appears. And, uh, the thing I want to call your attention to are those trees growing around the perimeter of this dump area, uh, which are the so-called tree of heaven, the Ailanthus altissima, a uh, introduced species, obviously, that is very much at home in North American disturbed uh, habitats such as this. It flourishes. And so we're going to talk about this process whereby nature uh, adapts to uh, you know, what we've done to the planet and what's the deeper meaning of that adaptation of nature to uh, human society. Now, let's see if I can, hmm, something is not clicked. There we go. There. So, as Emily mentioned, I um, published a book. Actually, the first edition came out in 2010 and the second edition came out in uh, February of this year. And it covers 267 species. And these are not, it's not, it's not all the species that grow in cities, but it's the common, most common species from Montreal to Washington, D.C., from Boston to Detroit. And what's interesting, if you look at the breakdown of where they come from, 34, about a third are native to North and Central America, 
44% Europe and Central Asia, 13% to East Asia, that would be uh, China, Japan, and Korea, 8% are native to both Eurasia and North America, and 1% to Africa. And so what this, you know, this breakdown tells us is the vegetation of our cities is as cosmopolitan as the uh, human population. And this process of non-native vegetation becoming sort of part of um, our urban or our ecology, our New England ecology goes way back. Asa Gray, a, a famous botanist at Harvard, published his Manual of Botany in first edition, 1856. He covered 2,400 species of which 260 were non-native. And these were species that were able to grow on their own and reproduce and spread. By 1890, that figure was up to 15%. By 1908, 16%. By 1950, 20% basically. And in the 1990s, when we no longer sort of use a different geographical basis, state by state rather than whole region, it varies, but uh, 24 to 35%. In Massachusetts, the about 35%, about a third of our vegetation is non-native. So this is a trend that's been going on for a very long time. It's not a new phenomenon that has occurred overnight. It's a, it's a trend. And this trend is uh, increasing slowly over time. And as what I said at the very you know, outset is that, you know, this uh, cosmopolitan nature of our flora, it really, this is, I just pulled this uh, chart off the internet, but it looks at sort of race and ethnicity for the city of Boston from 1940 to 2010. And these same changes, uh, you know, are in the, in the human population are due to socioeconomic factors. And everybody understands that. That's what keeps cities vital, is they're always in flux. And in much the same way, almost identical, our ecology is also in flux in response to you know, socioeconomic conditions in the city, technological changes, and of course, globalization. So, you know, uh, it always struck me as weird that we would, you know, sort of welcome and celebrate diversity in the human population. But when it comes to our ecology, there's, we definitely think that, oh, that should all be native. When in fact, the process, it's this process of urbanization and globalization and nature in cities is highly cosmopolitan. Now to start with, I, I, this is something I haven't done before, but I thought for this talk I would do it. Um, show you a little bit about the book, talk about what the book is about. And um, what's really funny is that in light of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, I've taken to sort of, uh, if you want to use the word marketing my book, as it's actually a field guide to um, being stuck at home. It's, you know, when you can't go anywhere except walk around the block or walk down to the river, uh, this is, you know, this is the book that will help you identify those plants that you see. And, you know, a lot of these plants, we see them every day. They're ubiquitous in the landscape, but because we sort of dismiss them as weeds, we tend not to notice them at all. So this page here, this is for the Queen Anne's lace, the wild carrot, and you can see that the book follows a template and there's um you know 180 two-page spreads with the text on the left that covers you know where is it from what are the vegetative characteristics what are flower and fruit look like and then it's habitat where it grows what it actually uh does in the ecological sense and then there's a nice section at the end which uh, my students really appreciate which is the cultural significance of that plant which is it answers the question of how it got here and what uses people have put this plant to. And uh, just as an example, I picked Queen Anne's lace because you know, most people are familiar with this plant, but um, what they don't realize is going back to the, the time of ancient Greece, uh, you know, over 2000 years ago, uh, they recognized that this plant had important properties relative to birth control affecting the ovulation cycle in females. So, you know, this is, it's been part of our human culture for thousands of years, yet when we see that plant growing in, you know, a vacant lot or, you know, along the side of a street, we just think, oh, there's another weed, and we have no idea the role that this plant played in the development of human culture. The other thing that uh, characterizes the book is that I take a visual approach to the to the, the learning the names of plants. 
In other words, they're arranged botanically according to families and alphabetically so that you can find them. But you can also just thumb through the book and look at the pictures until you see and recognize something. So this is the page for the Norway maple, which is a ubiquitous in Watertown. And uh, if that top picture there, that's uh, along the Charles River, the Norway maple in fall color. And those are the very distinguished, uh, you know, clearly, um, easily recognizable helicopter seeds that uh, people like to uh, stick on the ends of their noses or whatnot. But uh, it's really, uh, the text is important, but the pictures are equally important. So the book has over 12,000 pictures of which I took 98% of them. And many of those pictures I actually took um, in Watertown. And I thought I would sort of show you, uh, these are all from the book and, uh, you know, most of these pictures were taken over a 20 year period. This is the American Elm and there, there you can see that specimen on the left. That's, there's the post office. That's a spontaneous tree. That's one of the most beautiful specimens of American Elm in Watertown. And yet nobody even knows it there. And then on the right, that's, uh, you know, one of the old brickyards on Arsenal Street that's now been demolished. And um, now it's condos and, uh, you know, shops and things like that. So this, you know, when you study uh, this kind of, kind of vegetation, the spontaneous vegetation that I do, it's a moving target. Nothing ever remains the same. And uh, some of you may recognize this specimen of poison ivy growing right along the Charles River down by the where North, North Arsenal, uh, I mean, North Beacon Street crosses the Charles River. This tree-like specimen of poison ivy was there for years. Now, it got removed a couple of years ago by the DCR finally did something about it, but it was one of the most magnificent specimens of poison ivy that you would ever want to see, memorialized in perpetuity in my book now. And of course, another you know thing, again, this is a fence along Arsenal Street when the brickyard was still there, an incredible specimen of Virginia creeper uh, in full fall color. There it is, just sensational, yet, you know, nobody paid any mind to it. Nobody paid any attention to it. So really what the book is about is to try and get you to stop and look. And with the book, you can identify what the plant is and learn its name. And then once you learn the plant's name, that's the key that opens up all the information that exists about that plant. People sort of laugh at me when I talk about having relationships with plants. I mean, I spent my whole life working with plants. And the thing is, is that, you know, you have to know the name of the plant in order to have a relationship with that plant. And then once you learn that plant's name, then you can begin to understand uh, its life history and how it's uh, interacted with people over uh, millennia. Here's a beautiful specimen of river birch, Betula nigra, down along the Charles River, right off Irving Street. This magnificent specimen. This is a native species, although it's not exactly native to the Charles River, but was planted uh, very early on and uh, has spread and has now become part of our de facto native river vegetation. It's a sensational uh, plant and this is a sensational specimen. And then driving down North Beacon Street, just that bit, me open meadow on the right hand side just before you get to the bridge, uh, is this open meadow. And that's the, in the springtime, if you're there at the right time, it should be uh, not too long from now, another couple weeks maybe, the bird foot trefoil will be in full bloom. And it's just sensational. And thousands of people drive by this, but nobody ever takes the time to actually stop, look at it, and figure out what it is. So my book is designed to help you sort of make that jump and begin to learn the names of the plants that are all around us. Now, you know, uh, I'm not advocating planting these plants in your landscape because a lot of them are extremely aggressive and, you know, many of them are considered invasive species, but they're still worth knowing the names and understanding them. So this is the Oriental Bittersweet. Now, I, I have to admit that picture is not taken in Watertown, it's taken in Alston, just on the other side of the river as you drive up Market Street. I, it reminds me sort of of a rooster crowing there, uh, right over that railroad trestle. And then the, the stems, it's a vine uh, along the Charles River. So this is a very aggressive plant and vines are you know, very problematic because they like to strangle trees. So if you 
you know, if you like trees, then you kind of have to uh, get rid of the vines. And of course, uh, if you cross over the Arsenal, the, uh, excuse me, the North Beacon Street Bridge, um, you see this uh, at the right time of uh, the year, again, another two to three weeks, the chicory is in bloom right along the edge of that, you know, bridge. And that, of course, is considered uh, now crumbling infrastructure. And uh, two years ago, they came in, they redid a lot of the cement, they ripped out all the chicory, and this beautiful scene is no longer to be seen. But as I said, it lives on in my book. So these are the kinds of things that are just everywhere in the landscape, but you have to sort of take the time to stop and look at it. And the all first question you need to ask yourself is, what is the name of that plant? And once you figure that out, then you can begin to really understand uh, how urban nature works. Now, I'm gonna jump in, uh, change gears a little bit and talk the formal sort of part of this lecture, which is really about what constitutes, what is urban ecology and what does it mean? So this is the range map for my book. And this is typically, um, you know, how you would define urbanization in a technical sense, 500, the density of the human population, 500 people per square mile. And you can see when I talk about uh, urbanization, we're not talking about sidewalk cracks and things like that. It's a major force that is transforming the landscape in major ways. And you can see that, you know, there's a little gap between Boston and, uh, you know, Connecticut, but essentially uh, all the way down to DC, it's one, strong urbanized uh, environment. And the plants that grow there are, you know, very specific to, they're well adapted to those urban conditions. So this is a picture of, um, it's not an East Coast, I don't know if you recognize this, but you see that river on the right hand side, the trough. This is Los Angeles, and that's the famous Los Angeles River. And so you could ask this question, you know, what's native to the city of Los Angeles? And of course, nothing is native to Los Angeles as it currently exists. You could talk about being native in a historical sense, what used to grow there, but uh, all of the native vegetation has essentially been wiped out. And there are plants down there, in fact, some of them are native, but there's no longer a native ecosystem. So this whole idea of restoring a native ecosystem in an urban context, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because <laughs> this can't be restored to anything other than what it is. And you can have an ecosystem in an urban context, but it's not going to be the ecosystem that was there before people settled the area. Now, uh, one of the things that's really important is you, if you want to study cities and learn about how they function is you have to treat the city just like you would any other environment. And one of the major things about cities that we've come to learn is called the urban heat island effect. And this is the difference between an urban area and an adjacent non-urban area. And along the horizontal axis, that would be the size of the city from 1,000 to 10 million. And on the vertical axis is the maximum and it's a temperature difference between an urban and a non-urban area on a warm summer night. And that difference in temperature can be as much as 12 degrees centigrade, which is about 21 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the difference that, you know, cities are much warmer than the surrounding countryside. So what this graph is showing us is that if you want to learn about climate change, you want to understand how climate change is going to impact us in the future, you need to, all you need to do is look at the cities because the cities have already warmed up to the extent that it is predicted for the surrounding countryside. This is because of all the paving that absorbs heat during the daytime and radiates it out at night, all the automobiles, all the machinery that's generating heat. So cities are, uh, it's a characteristic, they're much warmer than uh, non-urban areas. And I apologize for this, but this is actually a really important slide. My colleagues at Boston University uh, produced this. You can see along the horizontal axis, that's the city of Boston is at zero and 100. That's kilometers. That's the Harvard Forest in Petersand, Massachusetts, where I used to work. And on the vertical axis, it represents what percentage of a 100, of a 100 square meter uh, sample plot is covered with impervious surface. So that would be a paving or a building. And then you can see that as you're driving out from Boston, you cross 495 at, you know, kilometer 20, that all of the sample plots within the 495 beltway had, were 30% impervious surface or more. And then once you got on the other side of 495, 
most of the um, sample plots, with the exception of one, which would be Fitchburg, are 25% or less. So the reason this slide is important is it tells you that from a biological point of view, you can also define urbanization by as a percentage of impervious surface, in which case 25 to 30% impervious surface, independent of how many people actually live in the area, creates a urbanized condition as far as the vegetation is concerned. And the way this works is that, you know, impervious surface alters the way water moves across the site, the way drainage occurs. And if you want to change the vegetation uh, in an area, all you have to do is change the, the drainage pattern and the vegetation automatically changes. So impervious surface is a great stand-in for measuring um, urbanization from a biological point of view. Uh, Another way of saying that is from the plant's perspective as opposed to the human perspective. Now, I like to equate um, uh, urbanization to glaciation. And of course, this is the urban glacier that we're all familiar with. We can see them down at the end of um, all over Watertown. Uh, development is happening like gangbusters. And, you know, in its wake, what we is left behind is compacted glacial till. <laughs> You know, this is primary succession. The landscaper comes in, puts two inches of topsoil down, they sow grass seed, and the vegetation slowly builds back. And what's really interesting is if you look at this map of Boston, uh, the, the, the reddish uh, area, that's the original topography for the city of Boston when it was settled by uh, the Puritans. And then uh, the beige represents parts of Boston that were filled in between uh, the settle, their first settlement in 1880, and then the blue represents areas that were filled in after 1880, so that, you know, uh, roughly one-sixth of the city of Boston is built on fill. And so this is, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really a interesting phenomenon. And this is, you know, this is deposited by the urban glacier. That's what this fill it came from. Uh, it's all bulldozed. And what's really interesting is in 2013, FEMA issued this first flood map showing the risk of Boston, to Boston from sea level rise. And you can see in the upper left, there's the north end. That's the original topography. And everything inside that red line is at risk from sea level rise. And of course, that corresponds almost identically to all the land that was filled in over the course of Boston's 400 year history. So, you know, in, a, in, a, in an ironic kind of way, uh, sea level rise threatens to restore Boston to uh, its original coastline. Now, when this map first came out, uh, real estate developers went ballistic because they thought this would depress the value of their property. And FEMA, under pressure from the uh, real estate um, lobby, pulled the map uh, off of its website and it disappeared for about a year. But then slowly uh, more maps began came, coming out and people just could not uh, suppress this information, try as they might. Um, one of the things that's really interesting, because I'm, uh, as well as a botanist, I'm a horticulturalist, uh, and if you know anything about growing plants, you know that it all begins in the soils. And if you want to have a native ecosystem, you have to have pretty much a native soil. And if you don't have a native soil, if you have fill soils, well, they're going to support the development, not of a native ecosystem, but what I refer to as a novel ecosystem. And you see there's a very, there's a this big difference between these native soils that are layered with distinct zones of biological activity. They're thin and porous, high organic matter content, low nutrient content, high levels of biological diversity, activity and nutrient cycling. And fill soils, on the other hand, no natural structure, heavy and compacted, low organic matter content, high nutrient content, low levels of biological activity and nutrient cycling, and often chemically contaminated. So, you know, this is the reality of much of, um, you know, the city is they're built on fill. And so this whole idea of restoring what used to be here on a fill soil, that is, uh, that sort of defies uh, reality to my way of thinking. Now, some of the other factors, and you know, what I'm gonna do in this lecture is really, how does the world look from the plant's perspective? So I'm gonna ask you to sort of suspend 
you know, your judgment and just think about, you know, life on the street uh, from, a, from a vegetation point of view and something as ubiquitous as salting the roads in winter. And if you live in Watertown, you know that we use a lot of road salt. Nobody wants to compromise public safety for the sake of a few plants. But um, one of the things that, you know, people just don't think about is that salt increases soil compaction, decreases water availability, and that's called osmotic drought, it reduces cation exchange, it makes it harder for plants to pick up uh, nutrients, and elevates soil pH. So this has a profound, just the application of road salt completely alters soil conditions, yet most people just don't really think about that. It's just something that is part of uh, the urban framework. And, but the plants know exactly what's going on. So this plant that, uh, you know, most people don't like because it's really unsightly called mugwort, Artemisia vulgaris, it comes from limestone areas in Europe and it is right at home uh, along these heavily salted roads in the Boston area. And so what is, the point I'm trying to make is that actually you know, vegetation has already begun adapting not only to the urbanized conditions, but also in many ways to climate change. And that is a good thing. And I'm gonna show you, you know, what does this adaptation really look like? But before I do that, I'm gonna talk about a couple of other factors that really define the urban environment. One of them is, of course, whenever you burn any fossil fuels that produces sulfur and uh, nitrogen, Oxides go into the atmosphere and then under the influence of rain primarily, but sometimes just under dry conditions, those nitrogen and sulfur compounds come back down to earth and acidify the soil and change its chemistry. So this is, you know, in the 80s, this was called acid rain. People don't talk about acid rain so much anymore, but it is still something that happens as a result of burning fossil fuels. But this is a Something I want to show you here. This is a, a map. Uh, this is nitrogen deposition in Boston, and this is in kilograms per hectare, which you know translates roughly into pounds per acre. And my house was one of the collecting sites for this study. Right here, I live, uh, you know, not too far from the Watertown Square. So the collector, over the course of um, the one year. Uh, 11 pounds of nitrogen per acre were falling down out of the sky this on the year it was done. And this is not an uh, abnormal year. This is, this is normal. This is what's been happening, you know, every year for the past hundred years. It's extraordinary. The Arnold Arboretum is very high at the bottom there, 13. And most of this uh, nitrogen can be fingerprinted. It comes from automobiles and the, the deposition is uh, heaviest in the springtime. Now that's a lot of nitrogen coming out of the sky and that totally changes soil conditions and totally changes the way plants uh, relate to the environment. The, the good news in all of this is you really can stop fertilizing your lawn because there's enough nitrogen coming out of the sky that you don't need to put any more on your lawn. And this is just part of being in the city. Now, as you move west and it becomes less urbanized, uh, nitrogen deposition, unless you live next to a highway, is reduced, but it's not a, a linear relationship by any stretch of the imagination. And this is the map that shows, you know, nitrogen deposition for eastern North America, or actually all of the United States, but you can see how it's heaviest uh, in eastern North America. And these are, you know, this is a legacy of, you know, coal-fired nuclear plants in the Midwest. I mean, coal-fired energy plants, mainly in the, the Midwest, that their, their uh, you know, emissions drift uh, across uh, the East Coast and are deposited uh, up and down the East Coast. Uh, it's, it's, it's not nearly as strong a phenomenon uh, on the West Coast, but this is a reality of uh, the world we live in uh, that we've created, and this is a direct result of the burning of fossil fuels. And what's, again, I talked about plants know what's going on. There's a, uh, there's a plant that uh, everybody loves to hate called garlic mustard. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's a little biennial plant in the mustard family, which uh, had been in, in North America, Eastern North America for about 100 years, but didn't start becoming common until around 1980. And researchers now think that that's when 
the amount of nitrogen in the soil began to reach levels that allowed this plant to be, get established. And so the presence of this plant in the landscape is a reflection of uh, relatively high levels of uh, nitrogen in the soil, mainly derived from atmospheric deposition. So the plants know exactly what's going on. They're monitoring it and they're responding to it. The other thing about uh, cities, this is, uh, is development. And um, you can see this map of uh, Massachusetts from 1950 through 2000. It's you know, way out of date, but you can see that, you know, this is paving, this is roadways, this is houses, this is suburban sprawl. And whenever you uh, create the infrastructure necessary for urbanization, that fragments the landscape and, uh, you know, disrupts biological uh, systems. And, you know, the thing about uh, fragmentation is it creates these edges and these sunny, disturbed roadway edges. If you wanted to correlate the occurrence of invasive species in any given landscape and you tried to figure out what factors it correlated most strongly with, about 60% of, uh, you know, the uh, invasive species issue can be answered by the question is how close is the nearest road? And the closer you are to the roadway, the higher number of invasive species you have. So the fragmentation of the landscape essentially opens up our forests and our fields for uh, invasion by uh, these disturbance adapted species. And of course, rivers like the Charles River, which are always fluctuating in their water level, sometimes they're flood stage, sometimes they're bone dry. That's a sort of a natural form of disturbance. And uh, most of the plants that you find growing along the edges of our rivers are uh, very adaptable. Some of them are native species and some of them are non-native species, but what they all have in common is the ability to tolerate uh, a, a big range in moisture conditions from flooding to bone dry. And uh, that's, in that sense, roadways and rivers are uh, very similar. Now the plants that flourish in the urban environment. I've been using the term adapted, but that, that's really not the right word. The term is should be pre-adapted. In other words, the plants that do well in the cities come from environments in nature that resemble environments you find in the city. So here's the ailanthus tree growing on the hills around Beijing. And that's the Great Wall of China on the left-hand side. And there's the same species that's our tree of heaven on the Great Wall opposite the Arnold Arboretum. And it's exactly the, anal the analogous habitat, you know, a limestone cliff, basically, uh, in Boston. And that tree has found its perfect niche. And, you know, this is a, uh, a building in New London, Connecticut, you know, and what is a decaying brick building if, if not a, you know, a limestone cliff? That's what it is from the perspective of this Polonia tree. Now, European ecologists who've done a, a tremendous amount of work on studying urban ecology, they're light years ahead of the Americans in this. They've determined that urbanization favors, so this is, you know, what's the profile of a typical urban plant? Uh, it grows well in soils that are relatively fertile, dry, sunny, and alkaline. So again, roughly 60% of the, you know, the plants that grow spontaneously in the city meet this profile. There are exceptions to it, but this is, these are, this is what urban conditions are like. This is what defines uh, the urban environment from a vegetation point of view. And, you know, it bears no relationship to, you know, what was here before uh, the pilgrims landed. Now, I have a very simple taxonomy, you know, because I'm a botanist, you have to classify everything. But in terms of thinking about the urban environment, you have unmanaged natural or remnant urban landscapes that are sort of left over from, you know, what the vegetation that used to be here. There are very few areas like this uh, in Boston. Uh, the Arnold Arboretum has a hemlock forest that goes back to the early 1800s. But uh, there are very few areas. If you go in the western part of the United States, you have many more of these remnant um, native or natural forests than you have on the east coast because our history is so much longer. Then you have managed functional urban landscapes. These are the things we take care of. Parks, gardens, lawns, ball fields, cemeteries. And these are dominated by cultivated plants, rich, highly modified soils. And of course, they require high to 
uh, medium levels of maintenance. And then uh, the category that I'm most personally interested in are the rural uh, or abandoned urban landscapes, which constitutes post-industrial land vacant lots, roadway edges dominated by spontaneous vegetation, compacted soils, and of course, they have zero to low maintenance requirements, which makes them highly sustainable because they don't require any input of resources in order to take care of them. I love this word rural, by the way, that comes from the Latin uh, rudus, meaning uh, broken stone. Now, uh, because I'm interested in sort of this spontaneous vegetation, the one place to uh, really study this uh, in the United States, or one of the best places I should say to study is Detroit. And from a sociological point of view, Detroit is a catastrophe. It's lost half of its population. There's no work. And, you know, it's one of the poorest areas um, in all of North America. But from a botanical point of view, what's interesting about Detroit is beginning in the 1960s with the, the riots that occurred there, the city has been steadily uh, losing population and large sections of it have been uh, abandoned and have been abandoned for a very long time, such that, you know, roughly 40% of the land area of Detroit, including both buildings and vacant land, is, has been abandoned. If you want to see how vegetation actually reclaims urban land, Detroit or, uh, you know, a number of other, Youngstown, Ohio is another place where, uh, you can really see how this process works. And it's a, uh, it's actually quite chilling, you, you know, because what you see is, you know, forests have begun growing up in, in a lot of these uh, vacant lots. It's, it's really remarkable to see. And, and some of the neighborhoods are totally depressing, you know, only maybe one or two in 10 houses are still standing. They've been knocked down, foundation been filled in, and then the orchard grass, uh, is covers everything and it, you know you feel like you're in the countryside you can hear you know blackbirds singing and so on and so forth and of course the vegetation is uh, taking over the abandoned buildings there's clearly a wetland up on the second floor of this um, I think this is the old Packard plant basically and you know there's there's water sitting on the floor there and that willow knows that and of course this is the um, loading dock wetland the drainage has been clogged up and you know, it's filled with water and that's the common reed is growing and you can see how it, you know, is following the seam of the concrete there. And I was there in early spring and, uh, you know, as I said, the red winged blackbirds were singing and, you know, this is actually an urban wetland. So, uh, you know, this whole process whereby uh, nature takes over a city is really something that I think we need to start paying attention to. Um, and I call it post-industrial succession. It, ecology, you know, ecologists all study what's called old field succession, the process whereby when agricultural land in New England was abandoned, how the far, forest grew back. So I think a, um, a coming field of research is, well, when cities are abandoned or parts of cities are abandoned, what happens when, uh, you know, vegetation begins to take over? And it's actually an orderly process, although to the untrained eye, it looks as though it's random. And, you know, to give you an example, uh, you know, one of the things that, def that helps delineate vegetation in cities is the fence lines. And these are what are known as safe sites for seedling establishment because, uh, you know, the maintenance crews can't get to the vegetation that's protected by the fence line. In this case, this is the nylanthus, and that's a, those are root suckers, and the, the root is growing right along that fence line, and those are all sprouts coming up from the root. And the fence is, is determining their distribution. And this is along the uh, Watertown bike path, if you, you know, uh, it, it's quite remarkable. And that is, again, a row of nylanthus, and there used to be a fence there, and they took it down and then uh, redid the roadway. But that, that pattern, it wasn't planted by anyone. Uh, the tree planted itself and is growing in that manner because there used to be a fence there. And of course, I love this picture from uh, Hartford, Connecticut. You know, the, the bonsai uh, uh, form of the American elm. And you just know the maintenance crews would love to get to this plant and remove it, but it's so enmeshed with the chain link fence that they can't do it. So that's what I mean by a safe site. And this is real ecology from uh, the urban perspective. And of course, 
you know, you always see grasses and other plants coming up in the uh, seams. Whenever you have different types of paving material coming together, you have a seam. So in this case, this is the trifecta of paving materials. You've got blacktop, granite, and concrete, and they expand and contract at different rates, and that creates a, a gap. And if the seed is the right diameter and can fit in that crack, it will then sprout and you get the, the vegetation always growing in the seams between different types of paving material. And uh, you know, another example is this little plant called carpetweed melugo. Uh, you know, I took this picture on Beacon Hill. You turn your air conditioner on in, in the, you know, June when it's just starting to heat up, the air conditioner condenses. That's the beginning of the rainy season. The seeds of this little plant, it's an annual from Mexico, carpet weed. They germinate, uh, they grow, it's getting plenty of water from condensation. And then September comes around, we turn the air conditioner off. That's the onset of the dry season. The plant essentially um, matures its seeds uh, and essentially withers and dies. And uh, the seeds will germinate again the following spring or summer when we turn that air conditioner back on. But you know, most people would just look at this and just walk, they would have no idea that this is actually, this is real ecology that's happening. But because it's happening in an urban context, we tend to uh, be very dismissive of it. And you know, I apologize again, I know I shouldn't apologize, but you know, I hate slides like this, but here I went and created one. But in the old days, when uh, you know you had forests and they were cut down for logging or for agriculture and then abandoned, they would uh, revert back to forests. That's what happened for most of the, the landscape in New England following abandonment at the end of the Civil War and uh, during the Great Depression. But if the, the native forest is converted to a city or a suburb and those are abandoned, they're not gonna revert back to native forests. They're going to uh, become what's called a novel ecosystem. And this is what is happening in the world today, not only in the United States, but in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, is these novel uh, cosmopolitan er uh, ecosystems are emerging uh, everywhere. And it's not a return to native ecosystems, it's these hybrid ecosystems, there's a lot of native species in them, but they also have a lot of non-native species. And the good news is, is that despite the fact that they're not native ecosystems, they're, they're ecologically functional. So this is a, a important slide uh, and it's, you know, to understand what native, what these, these um, novel urban ecosystems are, the interacting forces of urbanization, globalization, and climate warming destabilize native ecosystems and favor the spread of opportunistic species both native and non-native. The key thing there is it's not just climate change, it's urbanization, globalization, and climate change working together. Water, air, and ground pollution impact soil chemistry, which impacts microbial activity, which impacts nutrient cycling, which impacts vegetation. So it all starts in the soil. Everything we do you know, that's bad for the planet, it ends up either in the soil or it ends up in the ocean. And you know that's just the reality of uh, the modern world. And so uh, you know you can't just say, oh, I'm going to plant a native species, and if you don't have the right kind of soil, it's not going to grow. Uh, so you know you have to acknowledge the reality. And of course, habitat fragmentation creates sunny edges, which are dominated by fast-growing, disturbance-adapted species. And uh, this is really, you know, this is a list of the ecosystem services provided by spontaneous vegetation because not only, I don't, I say it's not just, it's not bad, I say that it's actually good. And, you know, you can look down this list, you know, carbon sequestration, but, you know, I'm going to, it's too long a list to go over uh, piece by piece, but I'm going to show you a few pictures um, from Watertown, basically, it's along the Charles River. Here, these are you know Norway maples that are holding up the bank of the Charles River. The fact that they're not native, uh, it would be a mistake to remove those trees there because we would lose uh, from erosion a tremendous amount of you know the land. So this is something the species is doing, and it's uh, of course not native to um, our area. This is down by uh, you know the Charles River, uh, just along Greeno Boulevard, right after you cross over. Uh, North Beacon Street, there's a toxic site there left over from the 
uh, when the days of the arsenal, it's leaking some, uh, you know, some discolored fluid. And there, of course, is the common reed, the Phragmitis australis, again, a European species. But that's one of the species that's really well adapted at absorbing heavy metals, absorbing nitrogen and phosphorus. So the plant is actually cleaning up uh, this site. Uh, at no cost to the taxpayers. So this is actually, it's performing a very important function. And just to say, oh, it's an invasive species, it doesn't belong here, is missing a big part of the picture. And um, I wanna go back to this slide. This is uh, you know, along the Charles River, just upstream from uh, Watertown in Waltham. And a lot of people don't realize that you know, the incredible industrial legacy of the Charles River, all of the factories up through uh, you know, Watertown and Waltham and now there are just a lot of empty shells there. But uh, the, the legacy of the, that era, there's a lot of contaminants in the, uh, the river, uh, most of them in the, you know, the silt at the bottom and some of it along the edges. But the vegetation that grows there is actually tolerant of those conditions and is actually helping to clean up that, uh, that mess. Now, it's not cleaning up the EPA standards, but they're taking a lot of those toxins out of circulation. So they're not actually getting into uh, the food chain. So that's actually, you know, this is something that the vegetation is doing. Uh, just that's what it does. And the plants that do this best are typically uh, the plants that are listed as uh, invasive uh, or non-native species. And of course, um, this is the Ailanthus forest over by the Perkins School, and it provides, you know, food and habitat for wildlife. Uh, you know, this is actually, you know, what wildlife likes is they like messy landscape. The messier it is, the more wildlife likes it. And so this vegetation that's not really taken care of by anyone meets the needs of wildlife much better than you know, a manicured landscape like uh, Mount Auburn Cemetery or something like that. And of course, uh, the vegetation uh, provides solace and respite for people, especially you know, everybody now really appreciates how important it is to have some little bit of nature to connect with when we're, we're stuck at home. And of course, you know, it's not just the, the beauty of it, but also it provides uh, good educational opportunities as well. This is a silver maple along the uh, Charles River uh, in Cambridge, not too far from Watertown. And I'm going to sort of uh, end with by talking about what are some of the, these plants that are, you know, ubiquitous and how did they get here? A little bit of the history of these things. This is, of course, the mulberry plant, the common mulberry. This is a legacy planted extensively in the 1820s when the United States thought we could compete with China in the production of silk. That didn't really work out very well, but the mulberry trees are <laughs> still with us today, a legacy of that failed uh, economic endeavor. They, and it's dispersed by birds, of course. And this is right in Watertown Square. This is a tree that blew down maybe 12 years ago in a hurricane, a big uh, storm, the remnants of a hurricane blew the tree down, but look at the way it sprouted back within two years. And, uh, you know, the mulberry is one tough tree, which is one of the reasons it uh, does well in the urban environment. And a lot of the grasses that grow in the city, uh, just in the sidewalk cracks and in vacant lots, are a legacy of the horse and, you know, buggy era. You know, people forget that in the you know, before the automobile was invented, horses did all of the heavy lifting in our cities and they had to eat something. And, you know, we had to grow the hay to feed them. In fact, uh, this is a, a, I love this slide, the very first urban planning conference ever held in North America in 1894. The prediction was that by uh, 1950, many American cities would be buried under nine feet of horse manure. Well, that was, that's quite a prediction. Of course, uh, it only, uh, as I like to say, came true for, there's only one city in America for which this prediction came true. And that would uh, have to be our nation's capital. Um, another tree that is uh, incredibly common uh, in Watertown and all of the uh, East Coast is the black locust tree. This was an incredibly important tree because it produces this rot resistant wood and it suckers from the roots so that you can cut it and it'll sprout back and you can make fence posts out of it. And all of the mine timbers in Appalachia were made out of this black locust and it's experiencing a revival now because 
it's like an organic pressure treated. You can put it in the ground and it doesn't rot and you don't have to use arsenic treated wood uh, for your playground uh, equipment anymore. So it's a very useful, but uh, you know, here's this native range. And when I was on the invasive species council for this advisory board, I should say for the state of Massachusetts, uh, against my recommendation, they put uh, Robinia acacia, pseudo acacia on the invasive species list because it wasn't native to Massachusetts when the pilgrims landed. And I said, well, they started planting it in the early 1800s. So, you know, is that really relevant? And the answer was yes, you know. And it, it's on this, so, you know, uh, distribution of um, black locust is against the, the you know, the, the law in Massachusetts because it wasn't in Massachusetts when the Pilgrims landed, but this is the actual range of Robinia pseudoacacia. So, you know, it's historic range. It's an interesting bit of history, but it's irrelevant in terms of the current conditions. And just because we passed a law declaring it a noxious weed, uh, the plant isn't, isn't going to pay any attention to that. So, you know, it's a, there's a lesson there. And of course, now the, uh, the, the market for black locusts is, is skyrocketed because everybody wants it for uh, this organic pressure treated wood. So, uh, and yet here we've banned its um, production in our state. Another one that most people are familiar with, the infamous Japanese knotweed. If you have this plant growing on your property in England, you can't sell the house until you get rid of the plant. And this was a hot garden plant in the 1870s and 1880s. The a famous garden writer, William Robinson, was a big advocate for this plant. Uh, but by the 1920s, when he, he finally wised up to it, he said, well, maybe you shouldn't be planting this plant. It was too late. And now it's everywhere, and you can see it if you walk along the Charles River. It's, it's absolutely everywhere. And, you know, I'm not saying that these things are benign or anything like that, but, you know, this is an example in, in, uh, along the White River in um, Vermont. Uh, Hurricane Irene swept through there in 2011. The native vegetation all got washed away, but the Japanese knotweed, because it has a deep root system, uh, survived. And that is now pretty much the only vegetation along both banks of the White River in many stretches uh, uh, where, where it is in Vermont. So I'm not really, you know, advocating the planting of these things. I'm just saying that where they exist, they actually are probably um, serving a, a useful function. And actually to, you know, go in there and eradicate these species, it requires an incredible amount of uh, resources in order to do that. Another example, I mentioned the, the Phragmitis. This is, if you might recognize this, the New Jersey Turnpike. This would be the, um, if you know your New Jersey uh, geography, the Vince Lombardi exit. And you could look at that and you say, oh my God, that's an invasive species taken over, you know, huge sections of the Hackensack Meadows. But the other uh, way you could look at it is there's over 500 landfills in this area and they're all leaking phosphorus and nitrogen and the Phragmitis is helping clean it up, uh, you know, at no cost to the taxpayer. And, you know, this is the salt meadow cord grass, Spartina patens, that, uh, you know, was there before the Phragmitis uh, got established. So if you wanted to bring the salt meadow cord grass back, you wanted to restore that landscape, uh, it would be very straightforward. All you would have to do is actually remove the New Jersey Turnpike and restore the tidal flow of water because that was a tidal marshland. And basically, you would get the Spartina back. But it, now it's brackish and there's no uh, tidal flow and that's the conditions that the Phragmitis likes. So one of the, the big problems, of course, with this whole idea of restoring uh, native landscapes is that to control the, the vegetation, the, the non-native vegetation, particularly the woody plants, requires the use of herbicides. Uh, you can't do it all by, I mean, your own yard, you can do it by hand, but on the landscape scale, you can't really do it by hand. And so, uh, you know, you have this, uh, this conundrum for land managers, which is, you know, yes, they want to control uh, the invasive species, but a lot of the people that live in that area, they don't want to see uh, those herbicides used anywhere near their property. So this is a real challenge for how, you know, uh, 
how this restoration movement is gonna move forward because they can't really do it without uh, the use of herbicides. So what I advocate is, you know, managing these ecosystems uh, through, through a design process known as intaglio, after design, where you design by removal rather than insertion. And uh, it's, a, it's a very different process. And basically, you know, what you do is you look at the landscape and you remove vines that will strangle trees. You remove diseased or damaged trees that are hazards for people that are walking underneath them. Plants that are unfriendly or unhealthy, poison ivy, multiflora rose, Japanese barberry, ragweed. Unsightly and aggressive plants that are commonly perceived as indicators of dereliction or neglect. These are the plants that, you know, People think are really ugly. And you know, the challenge is how do you manage these ecosystems to increase their aesthetic and ecological functionality? That's really what we need to start doing, not try to eliminate them or turn them into native ecosystems because that isn't just practical. And the fact of the matter is we actually need these landscapes as part of our, uh, you know, the tools that, you know, for dealing with uh, climate change as our, our climate continues to deteriorate. And this is a good example of the Arnold Arboretum where, you know, this is mostly spontaneous vegetation uh, and we mow the edges there so that people have good sight lines, they feel safe, and it sends the message that somebody's taking care of the landscape. But, you know, the landscape as a whole, there's very little intervention. It's just left to do its own thing. And it really is a very functional, what's called an urban wild. And people love this area. It's nothing like the rest of the Arboretum. It's very well maintained and manicured. This is people, when they're in this area, they feel like they're coming in contact with nature, which is not what you feel when you're walking in the Arboretum proper. So that's the end of my uh, lecture and, of course, uh, I'm sure they're gonna put this on my tombstone uh, when I leave this planet. But it is really, I think, something we've all uh, come to appreciate more as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we really have to adapt and learn how to adapt to these conditions that we may not like, but if uh, this is a Darwinian world we live in, and that's the way it is. Anyway, thank you very much for uh, your attention. And I guess, uh, Emily, is it time for some questions? Yes, indeed it is. Hold on, I'm gonna start my video. I hope I didn't go on too long. I, I no, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, I have to adjust my lighting here. It was a little bit uh, lighter when we it's, started. The sun is set. <laughs> yes, okay. So um, give me one moment to pull up the questions. Peter, would you mind putting your uh, title slide back on so that we can see that awesome picture that you took? Oh my God. Okay, so um, I had a pretty high volume of questions, so we won't get around to everyone's questions, but I do have them written down, so I will email them off to Peter after we get finished tonight, but thank you all so much for your lovely questions. Um, okay, Peter, so um, the first question comes from Mary Lou. She says, your pictures are great. What kind of camera do you use, and what kind of camera do you recommend for photographing things that we see around town? Well, what's really amazing is that, um, you know, because I started this project, you know, I've been taking pictures <laughs> since the 1980s, but I used a Nikon for a while and then a Canon, a digital rebel. That was my go-to camera when I did the first edition. And I was using that through the second ed and midway through starting around, I think, 2015, I got myself an iPhone. And I now have... Um, the iPhone, I think it's the, whatever the one that has uh, two lenses in it. it. It is, it's unbelievable. It takes just great pictures because, you know, to get the computing power that is in the iPhone in a camera, you'd have to pay, you know, three or $4,000. And as long as you have good light, the iPhone just takes sensational pictures. And um, it works really well under difficult light conditions because it's got this processing power and can actually calculate, you know, what the right correct exposure is. So as opposed to bracketing everything the way I used to. Uh, and the other thing about the iPhone, it's great. It's always with me. You know, I used to carry my, my, my bag of my camera and my lenses around with me all the time. And that got to be, you know, somewhat burdensome. So right now, the pretty much the only camera I use is my iPhone. So. <laughs> Great. Answer to that. Okay. Um, 
So the next question comes from Jessica. Um, she asks, should we try to quote plant native if we can, or if it's filler soil, should we plan to adjust our planting to those that would survive and thrive? What do you think? Well, what I would say is the thing about gardening, why gardening is such an attractive, um, you know, enterprise for most people is that you, you're the boss, you get to, uh, you know, you're in charge basically of, of the landscape and, um, oh, I, I'm trying to get that slide up. And, you know, it's illusory, you know, you, you, you're, you, this idea that you're, you get to play God in the garden, you get to decide who lives and who dies. And I think in your own landscape that you are in control of, you can do whatever you want. If you want to plant just native plant, plants, that is a good thing. And I think the more native species you have in your landscape, the better. But the fact of the matter is, is there's a native, non-native species are also very important, particularly those that bloom uh, or produce fruit at times of the year when the native vegetation uh, is not doing anything. So the hydrangeas that uh, bloom <clears throat> particularly the hydrangea paniculata that blooms in September, when not a lot of native things are blooming, provides a very important source of nectar and pollen for insects that really don't have any other place to go to. So uh, the list that I've seen about the best uh, plants for um, you know, pollinators, it's not all just native species. It's, it's you know, maybe six native species and four non-native species when it comes to trees and shrubs. So I think that you know, I'm certainly not advocating the, the planting of those these species that I've highlighted. These are the ones that are sort of the, the, the default vegetation in the city. When nobody is taking care of the landscape, these are the plants that flourish. And, you know, that is telling us something. These plants are adapted to the conditions that we've created. If we wanted to convert those landscapes into native species, that would just be incredibly expensive. And the thing is, is, once you go in there and you start ripping out invasive species and planting natives, that's really just gardening. You know, you're deciding who lives and who dies. And it's not really ecology from my perspective. Ecology is really about letting nature make the decisions. And, you know, there is a crisis. There is a, you know, an extinction crisis. And uh, some of native species, particularly lepidopterans, they need very specific insects to feed on. And, Certain insects need certain uh, special flowers to feed on, but those are the exception rather than the rule. Most of the, you know, the, the animals that exist in New England, particularly in an urban and in a suburban condition, are really generalists. You think about, you know, a lot of our birds, they have to fly from New England down to the Caribbean every year. So they have to eat a huge range of, uh, you know, plants and insects during that journey. So they're not tied to just one specific uh, food source. So I think that in your own landscape, you can you know, do whatever you want and certainly planting native plants is a really good idea, but I don't think that the idea of, that doesn't scale up to the landscape scale basically. And so I think we have to have a, a different approach uh, which is, as far as I'm concerned, is how do you manage this, this, these landscapes to make them more ecologically functional? Awesome. Um, and this is a quick question. I think you already answered this, but where is your title slide taken? Was that in Detroit? That's in Detroit, yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Just, you know, walking around Detroit. I, it's an unbelievable uh, thing. Well, I mean, what's interesting about Detroit is that unlike Boston, the land has lost its value. And so one of the big challenges they face is what do you do with land that has no, that has lost its value? You can't just create all the agriculture because a lot of it is contaminated. And, you know, there's more land than uh, there are, there is people basically. So this is a huge challenge uh, for uh, the people who live in Detroit and for the, you know, the landscape architecture profession that, that deals with these kinds of issues. Mm. Okay, so we had a couple questions about the urban heat island effect in the slide mm -hmm. that you put up for that. Um, so one person asked, Libby asks, why is the effect less pronounced in Europe than is in the, in the U.S.? And another person also asked, um, why, oh, give me one second I have here. Um, why is it more Southern in Europe? So Rebecca wanted to know why it was more Southern and Libby asked why it may be more pronounced in Europe. I think that's the same uh, question basically that yeah. the, 
the heat island effect. And I think I, I've, because that's a meta analysis, in other words, they took data from a lot of different studies and mushed it together into, you know, it's not just one study. It's hard to say exactly what's going on, but people I've talked to, the one thing that the, the automobile is not nearly as ubiquitous or, uh, you know, omnipresent as it is in, uh, you, you know, it's much more uh, abundant in the United States than it is in Europe. And that could be a big part of it, but it's really not exactly clear why. Mm -hmm. um, Great. Um, so Rebecca wrote in to ask how you balance um, a plant's ecosystem services um, with things that might be destructive. So she gave the example of um, tree of heaven, but they attract a certain kind of fly. So she asks, how do you balance the ecosystem services of plants when you're uh, creating a space? <laughs> well, you know, what I like to say is all plants, all, well, I use, all trees have feet of clay. The perfect, you know, plant does not exist. Everything is a, a trade-off. Um, and, you know, another way of phrasing that question, you look at the ailanthus tree is, would the world be a better place without the ailanthus tree? I mean, I, I, I'm of the opinion that the ailanthus is the most common tree in New York City. And, you know, here is, you know, uh, Mayor Bloomberg wanted to plant a million trees in New York City, which he did actually, but it's not clear how many of them are still alive. But, you know, he, when he did that, he wasn't even counting the ailanthus trees. And the, and the ailanthus is, you know, fixing carbon. It's doing what trees do. It creates shade. It lowers temperature. It's actually an important tree. But, you know, we need to count it. it. It shouldn't just disregard it because it's not native or we don't like it. And yes, there may be some problems associated with it. But I think the ecosystem services provided uh, outweigh the, um, the negatives. Mm -hmm. Now I wouldn't, if you, now if you were to talk about bittersweet, which is, I would say that, you know, with the bittersweet vine, I showed that picture, I think the negative impacts of that because it, it destroys trees and forests do outweigh uh, the services it provides. And that's a plant that should be controlled because uh, it is really pro problematic when it gets into uh, the landscape. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so Jack wrote in and says, asks rather, if cosmopolitan vegetation is pre-adapted to an urban higher temperature, what happens when an urban heat island, for example, becomes even more extreme? Well, I, one of the slides I didn't show is that, you know, that contrary to what a lot of people think, that actually trees oftentimes grow better in the urban environment than they do in the non-urban environment because it's, they have warmer winters, they have a longer growing season, they have all this nitrogen deposition. And those things can have very positive effects over time. But if you get too much of any of those things, too much heat, too much nitrogen, uh, and you know, too mild winters, which allows pests and pathogens to become established, then it can be a real problem. So all of these things are relative. It's not an absolute. So yes, you can definitely have too much heat. And definitely uh, plants don't like it when it gets uh, you know, much over, you know, 90 degrees, they kind of shut down because their photosynthetic uh, machinery doesn't work so well. All right, Jennifer wrote in to ask you, are citizen science platforms like iNaturalist contributing to an understanding of urban plants? And can you talk a little bit about iNaturalist? Well, I love iNaturalist. Uh, that's, that's a, it's a um, app that you can put on your phone and what's great is you can take a picture of it and it's crowdsourced. So then, and it knows where you are. So you can be in, in Mexico, you can be in Italy, wherever. You take the picture, it knows where you are. And then based on other people who are in that same area and have taken similar pictures, it tells you what they think it is. So there's, a, and it does it in about five seconds. So essentially what I'm, I, you know, you no longer need, I'm, I'm making myself obsolete, basically. You know, people used to ask me to identify all these plants for them. And I said, no, just get the iNaturalist app and you don't need me anymore. In fact, I don't need to carry field guides with me when I travel uh, because you've got, as long as you have internet, you know, access or reception, uh, it's remarkable. And, you know, every once in a while I've come up with something that, that isn't able to identify, but most of the stuff that I've, you know, I've, where I've used the app, it comes up with a pretty good answer. I think it's the correct answer. So I, this, and it, and it only gets better over time as more and more people use it. That's the really incredible thing about it. That's awesome. Um, 
Deanne would like to know if goose poop affects vegetation. <laughs> of course, that's nitrogen. We call that a nitrogen pulse, actually. And there are certain plants that actually know what to do with nitrogen. Think about ragweed, you know, all of your common, uh, you know, crabgrass, all the things that they grow in your garden as weeds. They, they know exactly what to do when they're confronted with a pulse of nitrogen. And, you know, you can see it if, they, you know, like when a dog poops on the grass and it's left there and they don't pick it up. In the springtime, there'll be a little the dead spot where the poop was, but then all around it, the grass is much taller <laughs> than the surrounding area. So, you know, that Kentucky bluegrass that is, you know, in our lawns, it, it knows what to do with the nitrogen. And that's one of the things, the native vegetation evolved under uh, conditions of very low nitrogen. And so it's a very, you know, with mycorrhizal relationships and everything. So the native vegetation, by and large, I mean, there are exceptions, when confronted with excess amounts of nitrogen, they don't really know what to do with it. Whereas the invasive species, when you give them extra, extra nitrogen, they turn that into growth. Nice. Okay, so Bill had a question about herbicides. Um, he asks if you're using toxins to um, cull certain kinds of plants, what happens when they die and rot? Does it re-release toxins back into the atmosphere? Is any cleanup really happening? And what's the benefit of those? Well, if we take an example, Roundup, which, you know, of course, has you know terrible reputation now, um, that, that does break down in the environment over, you know, the period of about a month, depending on the heat and the, the moisture condition. So, uh, by the time the, the plant dies, is that that, that uh, you know Roundup is probably not going to be persistent, which is one of the reasons why people you know used a lot of Roundup, you know, uh, back in the day. Now uh, the the cancer um, issue has trumped everything else, and uh, so the, the 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 use of herbicides is very problematic. And I think that you know. It's, you know, I don't want to, that's not something, I mean, one of the things that's really unusual about my book, most people write books about weeds, the purpose of the book is to tell you how to kill the plant. So I don't actually talk about that in my book. Um, it's really about understanding the plant on its own terms. And if you want to use this information to get rid of the plant, fine. But that's not something I'm really focused on. And I just know, I'm working at the Arnold Arboretum for 30 years that you know, the public has very strong feelings about the use of herbicides, and those feelings are getting stronger and stronger. And so, you know, uh, the Arboretum occasionally under, you know, very specific conditions uh, will use insecticides and some herbicides, but in general, because the, the public it really doesn't like it, it, that use is way, way down. But there are cases where certain plants, you know, the, the, like the hemlock woolly adelgid, you know, we couldn't grow the hemlocks without using um, some of these insecticides. So in that case, we've, we've made the decision that we need to protect those trees. And we use it very judiciously. It's called um, IPM, Integrated Pest Management. And that's designed to reduce the use of those uh, pesticides and herbicides to an absolute minimum and use them very carefully. And, uh, you know, so I sort of uh, advocate that I think IPM is, you know, under the right conditions is okay, rather than just saying, we should never use them again because there are conditions under which I think their use can be justified. Mm. Okay, so we've had a couple of questions about black swallowwort. <laughs> yes. um, so some people ask, like, can you just talk about it? And then someone in specific said, can you talk about the pod patrols that are popular and whether or not that's overkill or if it's encouraging people to learn and identify weeds? Another common name for that plant is dog strangling vine. If you can imagine a worse name to, you know, the uh, thing is, is that, you know, a lot of these, uh, it's in the milkweed family and it's, it's of course, it's in my book and um, it's a really difficult plant to get rid of because it, it, it established, it's got a, a very sort of deep crown that's really hard to remove. There is a biological control. There's an insect that's been released at the University of Rhode Island that's being experimented with that actually feeds on it. And we've done some research at the Arboretum that shows that, you know, under control conditions, we're getting good control of it. But it's going to be a while before that, you know, makes it out of, out of the laboratory. Uh, it is a really, uh, I think pulling the pods up is, 
<laughs> you can't beat plants at their own game. Uh, it's just not going to work. In my own garden where it comes up, I, I, I use a trowel and I, I dig the whole crown out in the spring. The idea that you're going to stop it from spreading in the neighborhood, I mean, that, that plant is everywhere. And you're not, even if you get, you know, three quarters of the pods, there's still that quarter of the pods and they're just chock full of seeds. So I think if you really want to do it, fine, but I'm not sure that's an effective control measure. <laughs> and someone also asked about getting rid of poison ivy. <laughs> oh my God, yes, the all over the <laughs> the greatest hits and there's a lot of poison ivy down by the river actually and people are very upset about it and of course it's a native plant and of course the birds love it and it you know provides food and habitat for wildlife but it is uh, you know if you're sensitive to poison ivy it's a real problem so it's on my list this is if you want to invite people down to an area i think that you have to control it uh, at least you know within you know two or three feet of the pathway system so that uh, people don't come in contact with it, uh, you know, as long as they're on the path. So I, I think that even though it's a native plant, it, it, is, it causes a lot of uh, pain and suffering for uh, people and therefore should be controlled. Um, can you recommend some good sidewalk trees for Watertown? <laughs> no, that's a different lecture altogether. I'm not going okay. to uh, take Sounds that question. Sounds good. Take um, just a couple more questions. Um, someone had asked if you could comment on redwood trees. What makes them so special? Why they get so big? Wow. So I'm from California, and uh, I grew up in Marin County, which is you know, part of the redwoods natural range. And I had redwoods growing in my backyard as a kid. I, I love that tree. And um, you know, they, they, they grow in what's called the fog belt. So a lot of their moisture, you know, it doesn't rain in the summer in California. So how do you get a tree 300 feet tall? The answer is the fog condenses on the crown of the tree and then drips down. And the taller the tree is, the more fog it condenses. So it, it generates its own essentially moisture through its, uh, through its size. So that's one thing about it. The other thing is that it's one of the few conifers that if you cut it down, it'll sprout back from the base. Most conifers, like a pine tree, if you cut it down, it's not gonna sprout back. And it has a very large structure called a lignotuber. So in the area in Marin County, all the redwood trees were cut down in the early 1900s. And so all the redwood trees that I was familiar with, they grew in these rings around these big old stumps that were cut, you know, 50 to 100 years ago. and you know, there are uh, specimens where, you know, they've gone through two or three cycles of cutting and this tree essentially is what I call ecologically immortal. It can just keep sprouting as long as conditions are good. So that's one of the things that makes redwood uh, really special as well as its uh, great size. Awesome. We just have time for one last question. Um, someone wrote in to ask, what are some of your favorite flowering plants if you had the choice? <laughs> Depends on the time of year, you know. Is it so? You know, because I worked at the arboretum for so long. But uh, the one tree that I've done a lot of research on that I just, you know, really, really like is the Stuardia. Uh, that's in the tea family, Stuardia pseudocamellia. It's a really outstanding performer of a tree. It's got beautiful bark, and what it is is it's a multi-season tree. It's got beautiful flowers in the summer great fall color, and then in the winter, this really beautiful bark. So it performs at multiple times of the year. Unlike, say, a lilac, that's great for two weeks, and then it's, then it's just nothing, you know, doesn't do anything. So in my own landscape, I like to plant plants that, you know, do something at least two, if not three times of the year. And so the Stuardia, to my, for my money, is my favorite flowering tree. But of course, I have to add to that that, I spent 30 years of my life studying the ginkgo tree, but that technically is not a flowering tree. So that's, that's why I didn't say ginkgo. What drew you to the ginkgo tree? Oh my God, I did my PhD thesis on the ginkgo tree and I studied it as a wild plant in China. And you know, why do the ginkgo seeds smell so badly? But that's another lecture. You're gonna to have to invite me back to give my lecture on the ginkgo tree. Awesome. Well, thank you, Peter, so, so okay. much. Really appreciate it. Virtual round of applause. All right. Well, thank you. All, everybody who took the time off to uh, sit in on the lecture.
Yeah, and we, um, I went ahead and posted information in the chat box about where you can find Peter's book. And this is being recorded. Um, so after we edit it down and with Peter's permission, we will put it um, wherever people can find it. Um, and thank you all very much. Um, stay tuned for um, all the other author talks that we have coming up. And thank you all for attending. We really, really appreciate it. All right. See you Peter, later, Emily. Everyone in the chat is saying thank you so much, just so you know, if you go take a look. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you all so much. I'm going to go ahead and end the call. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and thank you all so, so much. Take care.